from Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus. Welcome to Middle East Focus. I'm Alistair Taylor, MEI's Editorial Director, and today we're going to be talking about the potential impact of COVID-19 on conflict in the Middle East. To help explore the drivers of change and potential scenarios going forward, I'm joined today by two great guests, Stephen Kenny and Ross Harrison. Stephen is a non-resident scholar at MEI and the founder and principal of advisory firm Foresight Vector LLC. Ross is a senior fellow at MEI and is on the faculty of the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University and the Political Science Department at the University of Pittsburgh. Stephen and Ross are both scholars with MEI's recently launched Strategic Foresight Initiative and co-authors of a new paper and policy brief on the impact of COVID-19 on conflict in the region. Stephen, Ross, thank you both for joining us today and welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Alistair. Alistair, thank you. Great to be here. and Great to be here with you, Ross. Stephen, before we delve in, for our listeners who might not be familiar with strategic foresight, can you briefly explain what it is and how it works? Strategic foresight is an approach. It's, it's a set of approaches, really, for creating views and understandings of alternative futures and alternative possibilities so that we can increase our degrees of influence over the kinds of futures and possibilities that will occur uh, in the real world. We employ a variety of methods and tools for collecting and analyzing information about trends that are already observable around us and projections about where those trends appear to be headed, uh, as well as tools for identifying what we often refer to as weak signals, meaning uh, these are developments that are beginning to emerge that could be early indicators or the early stages of potentially significant future changes that are on the horizon. So what strategic foresight really is, is is about looking at the interrelationships and interactions between these trends and these emerging developments and envisioning the futures that could emerge when we take those patterns into account. The idea is not at all to you know, think we're going to predict the future or predict the occurrence of any particular development in the future. It's not a crystal ball gazing kind of exercise at all. Uh, it's really it's about using and assessing the information that we gather in a very rigorous way to imagine a range of different possibilities that all are plausible given what we're observing and the patterns that we're identifying. If it sounds fanciful, it's it's honestly anything but that. Done done well, it's a very practical uh, and important uh, set of approaches to uh, to understanding where things are headed in the world. What it does is enable us to test our current plans and strategies and see how effective they are in different conditions and and to make changes to those strategies that will make them more resilient. And it also enables us to identify actions. This is a really important part of it. Uh, Identify actions, whether those are policies by governments or business decisions or any number of other kinds of decisions and actions that if we enact them now or in the near term, can help move us toward future outcomes that we've envisioned that are positive or help us forestall future outcomes we've envisioned that are undesirable or, uh, or destructive in nature. Yeah, I think that just to add to what uh, Stephen just uh, explained, I think there's a tendency, particularly in government circles, to believe that this kind of approach is a luxury, uh, that thinking in the long term when the there's a deluge and a fire hose of information coming at all policymakers, uh, that this kind of an activity, uh, you know, is a luxury that 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 policymakers can't afford. And it's actually quite the opposite, just to pick up on what Stephen mentioned, and that is that that in many ways it's about the present because it's keeping an eye towards the future and asking the question. If we can't change the future or if we can't influence the future, then how do we best through strategic actions adapt to that future in order to better advance our own interests? If we're talking about the United States in particular, but it could be any country. And even if perhaps if we have a couple of different futures, possible different scenarios that could unfold over a five to 10 year period, is there a way for actions to to either shape the future so that, that it approximates the best case scenario for yourself, or if you can't, at least mitigate the worst effects of that. And so it really is about the present with an eye towards the future, and therefore it's not a luxury, it's a necessity. 
Stephen, what is MEI's Strategic Foresight Initiative specifically doing, and why is MEI focusing on this? What we're doing, I think, is really very exciting. Um, we're bringing this set of methods and tools that I referred to, uh, this way of thinking about the future and, and alternative possibilities into the Institute's work alongside of all the other types of analysis that MEI uh, has been doing so well for its whole 70 year history. And we're using these methods to help policymakers and other leaders who are, you know, the, the customers, uh, the consumers of our work, um, uh, those who are interested in the Middle East and, and have uh, leadership responsibilities in the Middle East to help them break free of uh, what are often very entrenched ways of thinking about the future of the region and to help them envision alternatives that are different from what I would call you know, the expected future. Uh, and we're helping develop solutions to some of the pressing challenges in the region uh, that might otherwise be difficult to even envision, let alone to implement and, and to identify innovative ways of realizing some of the opportunities and changes that could really transform the, re the region. Uh, Paul Salem, president of MEI, has said, as we've talked about the program, that he wants it to produce and communicate credible scenarios and research about the futures, plural, of the region, uh, both you know, nearer term, you know, the next five to 10 years, uh, midterm, and, and even longer term than that. And, uh, and most importantly, uh, the objective of the program is to produce uh, what he referred to, and I really liked uh, the phrase, um, to produce policy vision related to the futures, meaning what are the policies and investments and other actions that leaders might pursue to realize what we and they identify as the better futures. That, that's great, Stephen. And I think the other piece of it is what you bring to the table and what this kind of thinking brings to the table is it adds methodological rigor to what we're already doing. You know, we're already doing excellent analysis, short term analysis, medium term analysis and long term analysis of various countries of the region as a whole, how the international players interact with the region. We're already doing that. But I think what this, what's exciting about this kind of work for MEI is it, is it allows us to apply a bit of a methodological rigor to our already um, uh, finely honed analytic rigor. So, for example, you know, Paul Salem and I, um, over the last couple of years, have written, co-edited, co-written two books, neither of which have the name future in the title. But in reality, at least implicitly, talk about the, the future. Um, one is from chaos to cooperation, where we look at what are the possibilities of the future or in the future for some kind of cooperation in a region that is anything but cooperative. And then more recently, we launched a book called Escaping the Conflict Trap about civil wars in the Middle East and how can we think best about mitigating those, the effects of those civil wars or even ending those civil wars. Well, if you think about that, that involves obviously thinking about the future, but what the Foresight Initiative helps us do, and, and, and actually we work some of this into a paper that the paper you mentioned that Stephen and I just co-authored, series of papers we just co-authored, is it forces us to ask the question, okay, so if we want to get to a point by 2030, let's say, or 2025, where we want or we believe that the scenario of conflict, that there's conflict mitigation or some kind of conflict reduction, if not a full end of the civil wars, what has to happen between now and then to create that future? What do we have to see now and in the ensuing years? And in what order do we have to see them? What's the sequencing of those actions in order to get to that desired future? And if we can't necessarily get to that desired future, then how do we mitigate the worst effects? So it really helps us uh, more methodologically focus on some of the questions that MEI has already been focused on. Stephen, as I mentioned at the beginning of the pro program and Ross just referenced now, you have a new paper out this week entitled Conflict in the Middle East and COVID-19, A View from 2025. Can you walk us through how you approach the topic? Which drivers did you focus on? How do they interact? And how does that affect the possible scenarios? So what we, what we did is develop a set of scenarios uh, to use as a uh, laboratory, so to speak, for, for thinking about uh, the different ways that uh, things could play out with respect to the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. What we decided was important to focus on are 
those actions that are being taken already and that could be taken uh, in three different dimensions of the response to the pandemic. That's the, the public health care and medical response to the virus itself and its spread. Uh, the response of governments to the impacts on their economies is the second dimension. And the third dimension is the social dynamics, meaning how, how popular sentiment about and reaction to the pandemic layers into the sentiments and reactions uh, that people in the countries of the region uh, already have and are expressing regarding other social issues in their countries like political inclusion and sectarianism and so on. So what we've, what we've done is consider how the actions in each of those three dimensions could play out differently and how they might interact with one another. And, and in so doing, how they might spur change not only in the COVID response itself, but also in other areas. And we decided mainly to focus on uh, how they could spur change in the dynamics of the conflicts in the region. So, for example, in the healthcare response, the actions that are taken by the many different entities involved in that response may prove to be very complementary to one another, or they could be unintentionally or even intentionally at cross purposes, or at least uncoordinated. You know, you can think, uh, and we thought in terms of those kind of as two ends of a spectrum of possibilities with respect to the health response. And similarly, there's a spectrum of possibility in how the responses in the other two dimensions could play out economically. The focus could be very near-term, reactive, you know, triage kinds of measures, or it could be a longer-term focus that takes the fundamentals of the economies into account in a different way. And in the social dynamics, the reaction to the pandemic could pour fuel on already fraught sentiments within the populations, or it could have a dampening effect, at least temporarily, on unrest that predated the arrival of the virus. So what we did is consider the different combinations of these possibilities and how they would lead to different scenarios. And we developed several of those as a means of exploring how conflicts in the region could be effective over, uh, over the next five years. Ross, looking at the various scenarios that you mapped out, what were your key takeaways or biggest insights? Well, one was a methodological or a um, process insight. And that was, I have a friend who's a, who's a very accomplished novelist. And I remember asking him how he wrote his particular stories about particular characters. And he said he doesn't. He said he sets the conditions and then the stories write themselves or the, the actors act out in ways many times that surprise even the author. And I felt that when I was working with Stephen on this process, I sort of felt that through these scenarios that we kind of set the conditions, which is exactly what Stephen just mentioned, the, the sort of the interplay between the three different drivers of the future. And then we kind of played with different variations of those drivers. And we came up with, in some cases, very, very surprising scenarios. So I think one of the key takeaways that you just asked about, Alastor, is in terms of, if you look at the region prior to COVID, um, almost every country in the region save for maybe just a few, uh, are fraught with legitimacy challenges, government legitimacy challenges, to different degrees. But every country in the region is, is challenged, particularly in the, given the current state of events in the Middle East, with some kind of legitimacy challenge. COVID doesn't really change that. It, 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 it amplifies the legitimacy challenges uh, of some governments, and in other cases, what it does, even when it when it appears as if populations might be supporting their governments, meaning that they're not out in the streets, they're giving governments some breathing room, even when that happens, it doesn't necessarily mean that their governments are more legitimate. Even the governments that actually did all everything right doesn't necessarily mean that they're more legitimate. It means that somehow population is either beaten down in the worst case scenario, uh, something we call slow burn, where they're, they are beaten down by, by the number of deaths that equaled, uh, equaled the, the, the number of deaths in all the wars that the Middle East has seen over the last 50 to 100 years. Um, so it's, they're either beaten down into submission or to, to a certain amount of apathy, or they somehow are, are, are unwilling to go to the streets and risk making things worse 
And sometimes those, those conditions, even where there's no legitimacy, creates opportunity, if not for building short-term legitimacy, at least for governments to have a breathing room to possibly look at matters a little bit differently and see, rather than just a zero-sum game, see a positive-sum game. So the worst, the real surprise was that the worst case scenario, the one I just mentioned, the slow burn uh, scenario, is where government did reasonably well in terms of their economic response, at least for the long term. So they bought them, they they were able to, to institute certain strategic initiatives that would play out well in 2025. They started those in 2020. But their, econ- but their health response was horrendous. At the national level, uh, there was poor response. There was very little cooperation at the regional level and very little openness for international actors to come in and help. And so it was a catastrophic health response. Um, that response actually created the uh, same effect in the Middle East, which was a real surprise, I think, to both of us. The same effect that we had in Europe at the end of World War II, where there was complete destruction. And where that created somehow counterintuitively an opportunity for governments and populations to say, we cannot repeat this. Whether we like our governments or whether we don't like our governments, we have to be able to move towards at least a modicum of cooperation. And so that was one of the major kind of surprises. And the other thing in terms of the insight was that in many of the scenarios, we found populations willing to for, not forgive the past, not forgive the legitimacy, the things that created the legitimacy problems in the past, but at least look to the future and, and be unwilling to recreate what we have in Syria right now, which is basically a government that has collapsed or or system that has collapsed. The government hasn't collapsed. The system has collapsed. And so that even in the absence of legitimacy, even in the absence of any kind of really strong, broad economic or and healthcare outlook, um, there's a, there, the populations were willing to look to the future in many cases and because they don't want to risk things getting worse. And so that was a real kind of eye opener, I think, for both of us as we were going through these scenarios. Stephen may have something to add there. The only thing I add uh, that was uh, Kind of striking to me was just the, the the importance of going through this kind of exercise and seeing and you know if policymakers and leaders in the region uh, you know are able to do this kind of thinking uh, to to see what the second and third order consequences of their actions and inactions were. So in some scenarios, um, the major power, the regional powers, uh, sort of dialed back their proxy engagement in civil wars uh, in the region uh, because you know, of necessity they were focused more internally. Uh, in other scenarios, as Ross described, uh, there was a greater cooperation that extended from the healthcare and public health response to other spheres. Uh, and so this this kind of exercise, you know, just enabling policymakers to kind of see what it looks like when they do or don't do certain actions, uh, I think was 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 the real value of this and hopefully you know, will be the enduring value of this. Ross, so what does all of this tell us and what can we do from a policy perspective to avoid or mitigate some of the worst outcomes and encourage the better ones? Yeah, so we came up with three different policy recommendations or policy implications. Um, some of them are um, are intuitive and some of them are, I wouldn't say counterintuitive, but involve sort of a different level of thinking than we had before. One is that um, that particularly because this is a virus uh, that knows no bounds, doesn't know boundaries, doesn't know, doesn't respect borders, we believe it's a unique um, opportunity for the region to embrace the notion that that unilateral country only, you know, Syria first or Iran first kinds of approaches aren't going to, they're not going to work for the region in terms of solving the COVID crisis from an economic perspective or even from a healthcare perspective. It's not going to help the region and neither Iran, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Israel can do it, can can affect their own positive outcomes alone. So one of the policy recommendations, which plays on actually the, the book that Paul and I 
first came out with in 2017 from chaos to cooperation is that we need, and this was Stephen's term actually, and I love it, was the notion of a resilience architecture, uh, the ability for the region to build capacity through at least a modicum of cooperation to build capacity to be able to deal with future shocks. Uh, and those shocks could be economic shocks, they could be conflict shocks, and in this case, we're dealing with the most pernicious effects of the health, a health shock. And build that, use this as an opportunity today, uh, the, the awareness that's being created in order to build this kind of regional architecture today. Now, that's a recommendation. Do I necessarily, do we necessarily come away with the conclusion that the, the political will is there to do that right now? Absolutely not. That We're not suggesting that. But we are suggesting that, frankly, in terms of the region being able to recover from a health perspective, from an economic perspective, and from a political perspective, and to solve the conflict problems that we focused on in our, in our work, there is no other real option to get to a better state of affairs. And you could say, well, that was true before COVID. Yes, that's right. There were no, that was not, there were no real alternatives to that. But this makes it a more searing, more clear, uh, and where the, 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 the only way to get to a positive future for this region is cooperation. So building a resilience architecture was number one. The third one is, we call it, I think, the Hippocratic Oath, which is do no harm. In other words, what the United States is doing now in the region, in, in, in my view anyway, is we are amplifying many of the existing conflicts between Saudi Arabia and, and Iran. We're encouraging in some ways, either implicitly or explicitly, the conflicts between Israel and Iran. And we're, we're adding to the conflict dynamics at a time when we should be doing what we can to try to bring the regional actors together, um, not in some kind of a kumbaya moment where they put aside all of their conflicts, but to focus on what the problems that defy any kind of a single country solution and, and build and, and do our best. If we're not going to create, a, if we're not going to, if we can't become a leader in terms of building a resilience architecture, at the very least, step back and at least allow the regional actors to play to their best instincts, not their worst instincts. And the, the last one, which is, which is one I maybe that, that Stephen may want to pick up on as well, is to focus on the drivers. There were three, and we call it the 3D, sort of playing 3D chess. There were three drivers we focused on that Stephen enumerated and, 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 and explained, sort of health response from governments, economic response from governments, and then the social response from populations. Understand, take the paper that we wrote, understand the interplay between those, those, um, those drivers and see how we can play with those drivers from a policy perspective to, to perhaps ensure or at least increase, if not ensure is the wrong term, but increase the probability of getting to a more positive outcome. So those were kind of the three policy recommendations we came to. And if you want more information on it, you have to read that. You have to read the paper, either the short version or the long version of the paper. Stephen, building on these scenarios, what plans do you have to further develop this work going forward as part of the Strategic Foresight Initiative? Uh, let me say a, a bit about what we're doing to continue this particular work, and then maybe just talk a little bit uh, as we wrap up about what we're doing with the program uh, in general. Uh, so we are going to continue collecting information on uh, the actual responses that are playing out uh, and the projections about how the region and the individual countries may be affected longer term by the pandemic and the responses to it. Uh, you know, we may further elaborate the scenarios beyond just how the actions in those three dimensions of pandemic response play out, but also how other aspects of life and policy and society uh, play out in, in the logic of each of those uh, scenarios. You know, we uh, purposely did a very brief uh, picture of each of those. Uh, so we are going to continue uh, working with these three driver areas and, uh, and look at the implications of their changes in other areas. Uh, bigger picture, uh, we're going to be doing, not just Ross and I, but you know, all of us uh, who are involved in the Strategic Foresight Initiative, uh, and that's you know Paul and others at the Institute and, and others uh, from outside of MEI that we're working with, 
uh, we're going to be doing foresight analyses at different levels, at the regional level, at the country level, at the issue level, like you know, climate change adaptation, as an example. Um, studies that bring some of these foresight methods and ways of thinking uh, into, uh, into MEI's work. Uh, so doing analyses on the future of individual countries in the region, on the future of different issues, um, and, and things of that nature. And again, making, making this available, uh, one of the things that I think is uh, so important about what MEI has always done in its whole history is uh, really getting the ear of leaders and policymakers, both in the region and here in the U.S., uh, who engage in the region, uh, and just adding to their thinking. So in this case, our analyses are intended to uh, add some, some new ways of thinking about the future of the region uh, that they will uh, hopefully bring into their policymaking deliberations uh, and, and have some real impact on how things move forward uh, in the Middle East. We're, we're running short on time, but Ross, any final thoughts before we wrap up? You've got the uh, final word. Yeah, just quickly. Uh, sure. Uh, Stephen, you may rue the day that you gave me this quote. But Niels Bohr had a quote, and I think was picked up by somebody else as well, basically said that uh, prediction is very, very difficult, particularly about the future. Uh, all I can say about we're not here at MEI, we're not going to be predicting the future, but we are working very closely now that with Stephen and others uh, to build the um, – take the, the regional and the country and the functional expertise that we have at MEI – and bringing in and in, 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 in imparting on that a more uh, structured and fundamentally powerful way of thinking about the future. And I'm certainly, and I know Stephen is excited about that. It's exciting stuff. We'll have to leave things there for now. But Stephen Ross, thank you both for joining the podcast today. Thank you. Alex, we thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. For our listeners that are interested in learning more about this, I'd encourage you to check out the paper and policy brief on our website. They're well worth a read. And thank you as well to our audience for listening in today and to our production for their work on the program. We will see all of you next week. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support.